and we're moving through the book of Joshua. This is the second Sunday in June, and we're looking at chapter two. And I've called today's talk God's unexpected plan, and you'll see why as soon as the passage starts. So let's look at it. Joshua chapter two. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the man who came to you and entered the house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the man came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord God has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers, sisters and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the man assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return and then go your way. Now the men had said to her, the oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down and unless you have brought your father, mother, brothers and all your family into your house. If any go outside, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our, ha our, be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, came back to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So God's unexpected plan folds. The first part of his unexpected pl plan is the potential for complete transformation. The first part of his plan is, is really quite bizarre. On the face of it, it looks questionable at best that the two men chosen by Joshua to spy out the land should enter the house of a prostitute as soon as they arrive at the city. Well, is it moral failure or is it an inconceivable idea of the Almighty that doesn't quite add up with his character, that they would just go there and spend the night with her? It's neither. Thankfully, the Hebrew language comes to our rescue. And, well, what we know is that when people entered houses, well, they entered houses all the time in all kinds of places, and there was words and verbs for it and connectives and so on. If they entered with immoral intent, the Hebrew would be worded with the English translating as these people or that man or whoever staying with the person. But we've only got in the Bible here that they stayed there, not with that person. Now, that's very subtly different in Hebrew. You know what's going on if it says stayed with them or with that person. And also in the English, we wouldn't have the house of 
like we do in the translation of the New International Version. It would simply just say that the men went and stayed with, not in the house of, because the focus would be on what they were doing with the woman. And that's not here. Archaeological research shows that there were lots of taverns in this part of the world for traveling and stopping and doing all kinds of different things when you needed a bed for the night. And this one happened to be run by Rahab, who obviously had a reputation for doing other work on the side, probably to balance the books. And the point here is that a prostitute wouldn't be our choice of someone we would expect to be doing the work of God. But God changes lives and loves all people and has a plan for my life, your life, for everybody's life, no matter how highly or lowly they're thought of by everybody else. God loves everybody, wants to draw them into a relationship with him through Jesus, through a pure, into a pure relationship. When I was at a funeral of a friend recently, I got talking with my wife Caroline afterwards to someone we hadn't met before who's a missionary in Cape Town, working with prostitutes, reaching out to them. And how responsive, how responsive these people are when somebody reaches out with a birthday card or flowers. It means so much, very significant, just someone who's befriended them, showing them love of a very different nature from how it's defined regards to how they work in a cheap way. They can become the most dynamic ambassadors for Christ if they realize God's love and turn to Jesus. God will use you, me, Famous people, undervalued people. He, Jesus died for everyone, and he wants us to be his foot soldiers, ultimately. Rahab was being used before she ever even came to faith. God has a big picture, bigger than ours. And do you need to rediscover that God wants to use you? The pandemic has knocked a lot of people for six but God's unexpected plan is that he's going to use this difficult situation for good. We continue on the trail of God's unexpected plan. The next thing to say is setback. In verse 2, the king of Jericho, we read, finds out about the spies in Rahab's house. And it must have leaped back to, La to Rahab that he knew, for she hid them away before the king's men came to the door to look for them. Now, how frequently do you get to a good place where it seems that all is going well, God is good, something good's going to happen, and then it all crashes because of something that knocks you? And you're wondering within minutes if there's a God that exists at all. Now, if I put myself into the story as I was thinking it through, if I'd been one of the men, I'd have probably got as far as maybe bravely entering the house, wondering quite why we were being housed here when we were doing, let's say, God's work. Anyway, I might have done that, but if I'd heard that the king had found out and his men were coming for me and my colleague, I would have been off, absolutely off. I know me. I would have been gone at that point. Three years ago, when all seven of the Collington family went out to Orissa in India to spend a week ministering to Helping Point, who we support and pray for as a church. We saw St. Simon's School, named after this church. So humbling. But then I was getting ready to pray, uh, to preach on Sunday morning. And suddenly, our man, Bajuta, came to us and had us whisked away as a family without saying terribly much. Something about he would take care of the church or get others to do it. Just wanted us away from there. And we were put into a hotel in a different town. And we had to sit there almost all day, very, very hot, until we heard that the authorities who'd been looking for us, looking for evidence that Jesus Christ had been preached, particularly by incoming Westerners, until that had passed and they'd got tired and had moved on. I remember thinking to myself, this is awful. What's the point in even being here? Is God working through this situation? Doesn't seem like it. All these things went through my head. Many people, lots of Christians, really find it difficult when there's a setback. 
I remember once Nicky Gumbel, who I think got this from somebody else, when I went to a service one night in HTV, said that the Christian life is about blessing and battle. And blessing and battle and blessing and battle and blessing and battle and blessing and battle. And on it goes. There is a cost. There are setbacks. We look at the ministry of Jesus. Setbacks all over the place. The growth of the early church, which spread like wildfire. But there were floggings and leaders put to death. Very difficult to follow Jesus in these early days. Setback all the time. But people can grow through setbacks when they discover that God will get them through. And they come back stronger for the next time there's a setback. And we read this in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 to 9. You need to remember that God sees the big pictures different from us. We mustn't give up. It says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your, my, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We see, God is in charge. He shows his power by working through setbacks. The ultimate setback, of course, was the cross, when the disciples stood around and thought, it's finished, when in fact it had just begun. Our lives we follow Jesus Christ and hope to bring that hope to other people because Jesus Christ came in the flesh as God in man form, lived, died, and rose from the dead, giving an eternal plan for the human race when we trust in him. This setback leads to life forever and the best life we could ever dream of. We don't even know what it's going to be like yet. God's unexpected plan. Bizarre, and then setbacks, and now this, lies. The king's men came to the door and listened to the pack of porky pies that Rahab tells them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. And she said, at dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. And so the trail of the men went utterly cold when they were actually on her roof. God used the lies of this woman to make these men free. Rahab was somebody who, like many of us, suffered from a lack of integrity in places, but God could even use that. And how much more will God use people who are in relationship with him, which we think Rahab went that way, as we speak the truth. And the story of Corrie Ten Boom shows how the householders let the Nazis in to search the house for Jews. But because they'd built a secret compartment in which they had the Jews hiding upstairs somewhere, they didn't need to tell any lies on the door. There was another way. God's unexpected plan, part four, Rahab's confession of faith. And it tells us in verse 8, Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. And she goes on, We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. Now listen to this. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. This is so encouraging. Everyone with whom you come in to contact is a potential Rahab waiting for God to impress upon their lives. Do you pray for people before you meet them, whether it's business or whether it's school or family. Pray for people. Why don't you pray before your day begins? We bumped into, when, when it's not pandemic anymore and it's increasingly becoming free, we bump into umpteen people in a day, if it's a shop or waiting in a queue with someone. You never know when the opportunity is. But we can't just believe that we'll somehow be good witnesses and preachers. We've got to have God with us, 
not just generally as Christian believers, but people who are, let's say, prayed up and ready for the possibility that this might happen any amount of times in a day. Next part of God's unexpected plan. They escape, and it's fun. That's my word for this part. She let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Do you know, I'm still at an age, maybe not much longer, where I would still find the thought of going down the rope, or down a wall, if I had the right equipment, a great deal of fun. This was fun. I remember, well, quite some years ago, when I was a bit younger, sitting in Edinburgh, where I'd been a student, and lifting out the table, the kitchen table, of a fellow student when I went to his flat with a few of us friends. We were all Christians. We lifted out the table, and we put it on the street just next to the pavement. And we served ourselves a great breakfast, and we enjoyed communing with people. One of the people, actually, on that table had only just come into contact with the idea that you could have a relationship with God. That man told me this week at the funeral of my friend that at that breakfast was a significant moment because he discovered that there were people in the Christian faith who were actually fun. God wants us to have fun. And we had great fun that day. And you know, there's a song that we sometimes sing. It's got a line, even what the enemy meant for evil, you, God, turn it for our good. And that's surely a reflection of Romans chapter 8, 28, which says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You and I, we're all spies in a way. We're not doing anything underhand or lacking in transparency, but we are people that carry the promise of Jesus Christ. And in one sense, we're alien in a land that's not ours. God wants to use us. We're of the kingdom of God, and we will impress people. There'll be plenty of setbacks, but there's going to be fun. Let's be ready for it and believe that it can happen. God loves a bit of fun. I mean, when they went down the rope, it was serious. They were probably very tense. But if they were young guys, they probably thought there was an element of that. There was tremendous fun, especially as they're reflecting afterwards in the safety of the camp back with Joshua. Last part that I quickly want to mention is the conquest. And at the end of the chapter, they said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. The conquest was when they managed to take over the whole land as God had promised. God has a plan. He has a plan for every one of his people to be successful. It might be a life that's very difficult. There might be a lot more pain. Indeed, I've noticed that for some people, particularly if there's a physical ailment they have to deal with for years, it can seem like life is harder than for others. And yet God's plan is success. How does that work? It works because there's success in every moment we can draw near to God. So much of the Bible that people find comforting aren't the triumphs. They're the moments in the Psalms where it says, I am in the darkest place. Darkness is my closest friend. Psalm 88. And then there's Psalm 40. I was in the pit. You lifted me up from the muck and the mire. Gave me a firm place to stand. It's having gone through the experience. Success comes when we're close to God success in that you and I become complete in him and we become so radiant that others want to know and indeed our own lives have such a sense of fulfillment even in the pain there are so many people willing to testify to that shall we pray heavenly father we thank you so much for the story of Joshua and your unexpected plan help us to pray bold prayers as we believe it that in Jesus name whose death was for us, that we could be wiped clean of sin when we trust in you, in his name, 
we have the victory. Amen.